A man with his hands bound and bloodied lays in the town square, screaming as he slowly burns to death, melting rubber blackening against the skin of his chest as the fire renders his face unrecognizable. The people of his town stand by and watch, understanding that this is the price that traitors will be made to pay. This barbaric scene might sound like something befitting the Middle Ages, but in fact this horrific torture only took place in the 1980s. Worse still, it was all captured on camera. Today we're looking at another one of the worst punishments of all time, necklacing. Contrary to its innocuous name, necklacing is one of the most brutal forms of torture and vigilante violence to emerge in the 20th century. It involves either tying the victim's hands with barbed wire or cutting them off entirely, then dousing a rubber tire in gasoline and forcing it around the victim's head and torso like a giant necklace, hence the name. The tire is then lit on fire, leaving the victim to die an incredibly slow and painful death. Not only do they have to suffer burns from the fire itself, but the addition of the rubber tire means they're also contending with smoke inhalation and being coated in boiling melted rubber as the tire continues to burn. Even after death, the fire continues to burn, fueled by the gasoline, only stopping when the body becomes an unrecognizable husk. The history of necklacing isn't very long, with some of the earliest uses of this technique being recorded in anti-Tamil riots from Sri Lanka in the 1960s. In the 90s and early 2000s, former Haitian President Jean-Bertrand Aristide was known to order this punishment to be used on his political rivals. Brazilian drug dealers also performed a variation of this, called the microwave, where their victims are shoved into a whole stack of burning tires. But by far, the most infamous use of necklacing as a form of torture comes from South Africa in the 1980s, where it cropped up as a form of resistance against the inhumanity of apartheid. Apartheid was a system of institutional racial segregation that existed in South Africa and Namibia from the 1940s right up until the early 90s. While the system legally only came into place during the general election of 1948, apartheid has its roots going all the way back to the first invasion of South Africa by the Dutch East India Company in 1652. As was the case in many countries throughout Africa and the Americas, European-run corporations went to war with the natives over access to resources like coffee, rubber, precious metals, and in the days of chattel slavery, people. The Khoikhoi Dutch Wars of the 17th century displaced entire villages to make the way for Dutch-owned farms, which were staffed by a mix of white workers and enslaved people from other African countries under Dutch control. In 1795, the Cape was then seized by the British Empire and became a hotly contested territory for both the Dutch and British since it held a strategic port on the route between Europe and India. Because of this conflict, colonized South Africa developed as a mix of British and Dutch cultures. And while the region followed some of the same laws as other British colonies, it was not entirely subject to the English common law. Following the abolition of slavery in the United Kingdom in 1833, South Africa changed its laws to comply with the rest of the empire. However, much like the Jim Crow legislation in America following the Civil War, the laws banning slavery were loose enough to almost be considered in name only. Even though slavery was illegal, black natives and other people of color were not afforded the same rights as whites, and they were essentially made to work as indentured servants to white businesses. Following World War II, increasing industrialization meant a higher demand for labor in the big cities, which meant poor black Africans started migrating from the rural parts of the country into the cities looking for better jobs. This change wasn't received well by the white Afrikaners, who feared that increased population density would lead to whites losing their jobs and potentially being driven out by an uprising of black Africans with increased social mobility. So, in the 1948 election, the National Party proposed a system that would keep whites protected, a system which they named apartheid, Afrikaans for the state of being kept apart. Under the National Party, South Africa was split into four quadrants, white, black, colored, and Indian. White and black are self-explanatory, colored refers to people who were any mix of white and non-white, and Indian refers to the immigrants from India who had come over through connections with the British Empire. Under the four quadrants, there were a total of 13 racial federations or subgroups based on language groups. The white quadrant got to stay in the cities, while the other three groups were forced further away, isolating them and preventing them from pursuing higher paying work. In 1949, interracial marriage was outlawed. Under the Population Registration Act of 1950, every citizen of South Africa over the age of 18 was assigned to a racial group, and under the Group Areas Act of that same year, citizens were forcibly relocated to a township or neighborhood that was designated as belonging to their racial quadrant. 
This destroyed the previously racial diverse communities of South Africa's population centers and even split up mixed race families in order to keep each community uniform. Also in 1950 was the Immorality Act, which made it a crime for people to have sexual relations outside of their own race. All of these laws led to the development of an extremely oppressive society where the white minority controlled nearly every aspect of daily life for members of the other three racial quadrants. Black and colored people were stripped of their voting rights. Indians also couldn't vote, but they had never been given voting rights in the first place. Black people were not allowed to stay in urban areas for more than 72 hours without a permit, and all public places were racially segregated between the four quadrants. The government also enforced strict censorship laws, suppressing opposition to apartheid, and censoring all media that might cause people to question so-called racial harmony. Dissent groups such as the African National Congress and the South African Indian Congress, as well as the South African Congress of Trade Unions, were subject to mass arrests and bannings. Following the release of the Freedom Charter, a document drafted by a coalition of groups fighting for racial equality, 156 group leaders were charged with treason in 1956. Given how downright dystopian South Africa was during apartheid and how long these laws were enforced, it's not hard to see how a brutal kind of torture like necklacing might have eventually come about. But in contrast to what you might think, this wasn't some kind of state-sanctioned execution. In fact, necklacing was a tool used by freedom fighters in the name of the struggle. Because of how quickly the government cracked down on anti-apartheid groups, it was vital that these groups were able to organize in absolute secrecy. So if anyone in the community turned out to be a pro-apartheid traitor, they had to be made an example of in a way so excruciating and terrifying that it would make everyone else think twice about ratting out their neighbors to the authorities. Before necklacing, South African freedom fighters had already been using immolation for years. If you were suspected of spying on an anti-government group in your town, they might threaten to give you a Kentucky, that is, fry you until crispy if you leaked sensitive information. It wasn't until the 80s that this evolved into what we now know as necklacing. The first victim of the torture in South Africa was, according to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a woman named Maki Skosana, a single mother from the township of Duduza. Skosana was suspected of allying with a government task force called Third Force, who were reportedly behind the deaths of four young activists. While attending the funeral for the murdered activists, Skosana was ambushed by a mob of 500 people who beat her into submission, stripped her naked, and pinned her down with a large rock so she couldn't escape. She was shoved into a tire, doused with petrol, and her body was mutilated with broken glass before being set alight. If that wasn't gruesome enough, this was all captured on live TV as a crew had been present to film the funeral. Graphic images of Skosana's burning body were reprinted by South African state media as a form of anti-resistance, pro-segregation propaganda. Necklacing was an effective way of sending a message for certain, but in the broader community of anti-apartheid activism, it was considered highly controversial. The ANC, South Africa's most broadly supported anti-apartheid group, and the party of future President Nelson Mandela came out in opposition to the use of necklacing as punishment. Desmond Tutu, another prominent activist, was particularly sickened by the practice. In response to the footage of Skosana's death, he was quoted as saying, If the violence continues, I will pack my bags, collect my family, and leave this beautiful country. Other members of the ANC, however, were a little more lenient. Many found it a brutal but necessary measure to deter black people from turning on their communities and becoming police informants. Then-president of the ANC, Oliver Tambo, once admitted, We don't like necklacing, but we understand its origins. It originated from the extremes to which people were provoked by the unspeakable brutalities of the apartheid system. Between 1984 and 1987, 672 people were burned alive by anti-apartheid mobs, and half of those people were victims of necklacing. Even though the prevailing attitude toward necklacing mostly ranged from disapproval to outright disgust, there was one member of the ANC who seemed like she was all for it, Winnie Mandela. Winnie was the wife and public liaison of Nelson Mandela, who was in prison at the time and had been since the 1960s. She was a social worker and activist who had degrees in both social work and international relations. Winnie met Nelson Mandela at a bus stop in 1957 when she was 22, and he was still married to his first wife, Evelyn Mace. The couple hit it off immediately and were married the same year Mandela and Mace divorced. Over the next two years, Winnie and Nelson would have two daughters. Their marriage hit its first speed bump in 1963 when Nelson Mandela was arrested and jailed. Winnie Mandela became an activist in her own right and attracted attention from the National Party who imprisoned, banished, and spied on her on multiple occasions. 
Her longest period in jail was 491 days, and during this time she was beaten, tortured, and kept in solitary confinement. According to her own accounts, this experience hardened her, and it was her own experience of being tortured that made her more willing to endorse violence than her fellow activists. She was known to dress in military garb and kept the Mandela United Football Club around as her personal bodyguards. The soccer team lived with her and was reportedly ordered to kidnap and murder people on her behalf on multiple occasions. Most inflammatory of all, in a 1986 speech Winnie Mandela openly encouraged necklacing, saying, We have no guns, we only have stone, boxes of matches, and petrol. Together, hand in hand, with our matches and our necklaces, we shall liberate this country. Understandably, the ANC started to distance itself from her after the fact, fearing what she would do to their reputation. Winnie Mandela's violent tendencies also no doubt played a part in her divorce from Nelson Mandela. South Africa held its first free and open election in 1994, officially bringing an end to apartheid. But even though the goal of liberation had been achieved, necklacing didn't stop. It's still a common form of mob justice in South Africa well into the 21st century. In 2011, a pair of men who broke into a woman's home in Port Elizabeth, who robbed her, killed her, and nearly sexually assaulted her, were necklaced in public. Their victim, a 74-year-old woman named Angelina Mahulwana, told BBC reporter Pumza Filani that she thought the men got what they deserved. This was one of four necklacing incidents in the city that month, all of them motivated by frustration at the police's inaction on violent crimes in the area. When Filani interviewed locals around Port Elizabeth about the necklacing incidents, she got a mixed response. Many, like the ANC members back in the 80s, considered it a necessary evil that scares potential offenders into behaving themselves. One man, Scalo Lucas, said, Mob justice isn't right, but it has a place in our society. It does reduce crime. We have seen a decrease in the crime here. Another resident, Sia Samkela Solani, was more critical, saying sometimes the wrong people get punished. There's a lot of room for mistaken identity. In 2015, a video started circulating online of five young men being necklaced in northwest Johannesburg. While some initially suspected the attack was motivated by anti-Zimbabwean xenophobia, it was later revealed the victims had previously been involved in a bar fight in Rustenburg earlier that year. Witnesses said the group was involved in a bar fight with a local who they later attacked and beat to death in the street. After the attack, some of the other Rustenburg locals decided to take the law into their own hands, tracking the group of men down, overpowering them, and setting them alight. Thankfully, the police were called in and all five were taken to the hospital. Four were severely burned, and the fifth was uninjured. Two of them, one of whom was a minor, died from their injuries while in the hospital. Even more recently in 2018, two men from Wells Estate barely escaped with their lives after their group was attacked by an angry mob accusing them of being car thieves. According to Mila Mioli, one of the survivors, the five men were dragged out into the bush, stripped, then forced into fuel-soaked tires and set on fire. Mioli and his friend Nathan Williams were only able to escape when the mob was focused on the other three members of the group. Outside of South Africa, there have been a few incidents of necklacing as well. After the assassination of Indriya Gandhi by her Sikh bodyguard in 1984, angry mobs in India necklaced innocent Sikhs in retaliation. Then, on the Ivory Coast in the early 90s, a group of university students whose dormitory had been plagued by thefts caught the suspected thieves and set them alight via necklacing. No matter what country this torture is performed in, it is still most often a tactic of vigilantes. And as some of these more recent incidents have proven, as long as there are communities who feel underserved by the police and people mad enough to take the law into their own hands, there will likely still be incidents of necklacing. Necklacing is a uniquely modern torture invented by desperate people seeking to act against an oppressive government by any means necessary. While it's impossible to say how much impact the practice really had on the anti-apartheid cause, many still agree with Winnie Mandela and consider it to have been a powerful tool against oppression, arguing that it protected freedom fighters from the brutality of the state. Wherever you stand on it, necklacing serves as a harrowing example of the fact that even people fighting for freedom and equality can take things too far. What started as an extreme intimidation tactic has evolved over time as a weapon of mob justice that kills just as many innocent people as it does actual criminals. Now go check out The Guillotine, Worst Punishments in the History of Mankind, or check out this video instead.